Thank you, everybody. Um, so the goal for the next 15 minutes from my side is to convince you that depression has nothing to do, or at least is not just being sad or sadness at all. And I'm going to start saying that, in fact, depression manifests itself as a sum of many different symptoms, um, which include or might not even include depression. The first big type of symptoms that affect depressed patients is something that uh, has to do with moods, which includes alteration of emotion and thoughts. And because we know that depressed patients very often uh, suffer from alteration of their memory, alteration in their thoughts, anxiety, suicidality thoughts, and also mood swings and sadness. But that happens sometimes and sometimes cannot be there. But this is not all of, all of it. Depression also includes alteration in behavior, especially social behavior. We know that depressed patients tend to uh, withdraw from their family, from their friends, and also from everyday life, including work and everyday activity. And finally, depression also affects the physical aspect of our patients. Depressed patients, in fact, manifest normally lack of energy, lack of uh, lack of uh, proper sleep, they have a uh, change in their appetite and very often ends up in drug abuse situations. For all these reasons, depression is now considered the leading cause of disability worldwide and is known to affect roughly 4% of the whole population. And interesting, the distribution between women and men, that's not equal and we know that women are more prone to develop depression than men. So despite this very clinical picture, depression is still one of those pathology that is not so uncommon to hear people replying to a depressed patient, oh, just stop being sad, I was sad yesterday as well, just snap out of it. But depression, as in any other pathology, is not something you can snap out of it. Because as any other pathology, is characterized by a malfunctioning organ in your body. When we talk about depression, the malfunctioning organ that is not working properly in your body is the brain. And we know that not only the brain of patients is not responding normally as is expected to activities, but also in, la in a normal state. It's not functioning as it's supposed to be. On top of this big malfunctioning of the brain, we know that during the depression course, also other organs start to work not properly. And these organs include many different, for example, the immune system, that is the one that protects you from germs, and your heart, the metabolism, including the gut and the stomach and so on, and your hormones in general. So why these organs especially, why does the brain stop working? So what's the trigger of depression? Well, depression is a complex pathology, and that means that it comes out of interaction of risk factors. For depression, we know two main risk factors. The first one being the DNA. As also Lily mentioned at the beginning of the day, the DNA is what your genetic code that you inherit from your parents. And as you might know, the DNA is what determines all your body function. And importantly, also every, each, one, each one of us has a unique DNA. We, we, which means when we look inside your DNA, we're going to be able to find small differences between you and everybody else around the world. And we know when we look at these small changes that some of them increase your chance of developed depression and some decrease your chance of developed depression. But this is not enough to explain you if someone gets uh, depressed and someone doesn't. We know that a second factor plays a major role in this, and this is what we call, in the scientific terms, environment. With environment, we refer to any experiences you go through your life. So as DNA, also these experiences can be good, so it can in in um, improve your chances to stay healthy, and this includes like the exercise or having supportive environment around you, and some of them can be bad and increase your chances of developing depression, like, for example, trauma or drugs. We know that your DNA small changes determine how you're going to respond to what happens to you. So there is an interaction between two, these two factors that at the same time interact on a level of the brain and de determine how your brain works. And if you collect enough negative risk factors, your brain and yourself might develop depression. Throughout many years of studies, uh, we found out that especially one factor is particularly important, somehow plays a major role, and this is stress. So it's a very negative impacting uh, life experiences. 
So when we talk about stress or a stressor, we refer to any real or perceived abnormal situation that can happen to you. So that can be either physical or psychological. And this is such an important uh, event in your life that's something that you need to be able to survive. For this reason, in your body, you have a stress system that is able to allow you to survive and overcome the stress. The stress system starts in your brain. When you perceive a stress, your brain activates sort of a response that leads to activation of many other organs and ultimately leads to the production of hormones, especially cortisol, something you might have already heard of. Cortisol and these hormones go in your blood torrent, and at the same time, they act on many different organs, changing their function, allowing you to respond to the stress. Among these organs, importantly, also the brain is one of the organs that is somehow targeted from the cortisol, and on the, cord on the brain, also there, we change its functionality. For, for example, we know that we impact on memory and focus. And the second response, the very important one that from, comes from the brain, is the understanding that your stress response has been active and is now helping you out to overcome the stress, so the, stress, the, the, the brain now needs to tell the rest of the body that the stress has passed and you need to go back to normality. So that's the other very important task of the brain is to shut down this response. And this overall allows you to overcome any stress in your life. And the proof that, let's say, a proof that this is a very important system can be found in the fact that this system can be found in a very similar manner also in simpler animals like fish or mice. And we know, or at least we know, we, we learn that, however, the system can go rogue. What happens when you are overexposed, keep being exposed to stress? Well, somehow something stops working properly and your stress system keep being activated. You keep have production of these hormones and somehow your brain doesn't shut down the response anymore. And this is a situation that's very often observed in depressed patients. Their stress system keeps being activated, their levels in the blood torrents are not as they are supposed to be of these hormones. So this is the strong connection that we acquired throughout the years, and we can also see it like more in ground numbers when we look at stress in everyday life or in like people, like human studies. So we know that life stress, that something can, can happen continuously in time, so it becomes chronic. There are many different phases of life stress. One of them that we can take as an example is bullying. So we know that, as I mentioned before, depression in the normal population are affect roughly between 5, to five and 4% of the population. However, when we focus and look only at those people that got bullied throughout their life, we know that the percentage of people that are affected by depression increases to 15%. So being bullied chronically, so for a long period in your life, increases your chance of developing depression of three times. So these are very important studies. This is all the grounds of the press research came from. However, if we now want to ask more complicated question, keeping on with the study becomes a little bit complicated. Why? Because any study that involves humans is also suffer, suffer from some limitation. When we study, for example, bullying, we know that all our patients actually went through many different experiences in their life, so our samples will be very different. Also, all of our, all our people are going to have different DNA, as I mentioned before. And finally, the main organ that is malfunctioning in the, in the, in the body of the press patient is brain, is brain. And we cannot really access directly to the brain of our patients. So this is when research tries to look around for solution, a way of to overcome this, uh, these problems. And one of the solutions the research found was to turn himself to other, uh, other system that might help to make some research that can be helpful also for human. One of these systems is the rodents, or more specifically mice and rats, because uh, using mice and rats allows us to overcome some of these disadvantages. When we use mice and rats, for example, we can define controlled experiments. We know what our mice went through in matter of experiences, and we know what their, their DNA look like. Also, we can modify their DNA, and finally, we do have access to the organs of the mice. 
So given the fact, three very important things, that the stress system is similar between mice and humans, that the DNA code is very similar between humans and mice, and finally, that somehow their brain function can, can be recon reconnecting between the two systems, we, we learn that we can use mice effectively for our questions. So how do we study depression in mice? Well, we don't. Wait, sorry, I just finished telling you that we use mice. Well, yes, but I also told you that depression is a mood disorder, which means when we diagnose depression, we sit down with the patient, we ask him or her, how do you feel, what's your thoughts, what's your mood? We cannot really sit down with a mouse and ask it, how do you feel today, is it better than yesterday? But we can use the mice to study the mechanisms that we think are behind depression. How do we do that? Well, in a kind of similar way that we do with humans. So we know that humans have a well-being state. They enjoy specific stuff, they are social animals, and they have a normal functioning body. And we know that when a combination of DNA and environment applies, their, DNA, their state can change and they develop a depressed state, which includes lack of enjoyment normally, social withdrawal, and a change in their body functioning. Well, we can look at similar things in mice as well. We know that mice have a well-being state. They are normally animals that enjoy specific stuff. For example, they love sugar. They are very social animals as well as humans, and they have normal body functioning. In, in experimental settings, we can apply a combination of DNA and environment. And when we talk about environment, we normally talk about stress. And we are able to observe an alteration in their behavior or in their state that we call depressive-like, because we can never talk about depression. And this usually includes lack of enjoyment. For example, they become indifferent to sugar, they become social avoidant, and their body function start to change. So how does this happen in real life? Well, we, we have many different types of, for example, stress that we can apply. Uh, one of the most used so far, the most successful, is called social chronic defeat. Social chronic defeat is very often thought to be similar to what a bullying situation is. Chronic social defeat is based on the fact that mice are social animals but are also very territorial. So how does this work? Well, we take a mouse, a big, usually white mouse, and we give, it, we give him it uh, his own cage. So this is going to become his home and his own territory that he wants to protect. And then we take our mouse of interest, this small black guy, and we put it inside the cage of the, the other one. What's going to happen is the big mouse is going to protect his own territory. So it's going to attack our mouse of interest, the black one. It's going to defeat it. And that's it, because we are going to rescue the mouse at that point. But we are going to make this happen multiple times across many days. So once per day, usually 10, 21 days. So what's happened to our small mouse that is being exposed to a physical and a psychological stress that it cannot avoid, and it keeps happening, as bullying happens in real life to humans. What we can see is that these mice, after chronic social defeat, do develop some of those characteristics that we can observe in depressed patients. For example, they have depressive-like symptoms, so they, if when they are put in presence of another mouse, normally mice live, love seeing other mice. They go interact because they are social. These poor mice, after so chronic social defeat, they start to be away from them and avoid it, so they de develop social avoidance. They also tend to not like sugar anymore, so they become indifferent, and, any and many other different types of behavior, like they become anxious, and at the same time, we can also see depressive-like bodies, because we know that, the, for example, the stress system malfunction and the level of the cortisol in their blood is always increased, as we can see in depressed patients. And we know that their brain works differently from healthy controls, similar in the same regions that we can observe in humans. But since now we are using mice, we can start and go a little bit deeper and ask ourselves, what else can we discover about the brain of these animals and that can help full in human research. Well, since we do have access to the uh, brain of our mice, we can ask ourselves, what's the structure underneath? Is it working properly or not? So you might know brain as any other organs is uh, composed of brain of cells, so brain cells, which are very specific in this case, they have a very specific structure. So we can ask ourselves, 
Is the brain not working properly because the cells underneath are not working properly? When we look at the cells of the press of, um, of normal mice, this is how a brain cell look like in green. So they have a very well structure. They have long branches, they are very uh, wide, they have many, and this allows the cell to actually be healthy and to make the brain work. So this is a structure that is necessary for the brain to work. When we look at the cells of a defeat mouse, that's what it looks like. So as you can see, the cell is not as it's supposed to be. It's smaller, uh, there are not as many branches, they are shorter, and this is telling us that these cells cannot be working properly because it's not doesn't have the structure that it's supposed to be. So from this point, we can also ask further questions like, why are these cells different? Why is this defect somehow contributing to the behavioral changes that we see? Can we prevent it or fix it? So this is just an example of how mouse research is helping in an understanding of stress response and depression. But uh, mice are used in, uh, every day in many different labs, trying to solve many different questions. For example, exactly how the brain changes with depression or chronic stress exposure, how the brain cells are affected in this process, why women and men develop uh, depression with different ratio, why um, antidepressants, how they work, because we currently don't know how antidepressants work, even if they do, and can we actually improve the current treatments? So after this 15-minute talk, I would like to go home and have like, just a few points in your mind that depression is a very common pathology that affects 300 million people worldwide, that is a complex pathology made of interaction of complex symptoms that might or might not include the, uh, sadness, and it comes out of interaction of the DNA and environment, especially stress plays a role, and that we can use mice to kind of start to understand some of these, uh, these, um, these alterations. And overall, I would like you that next time that the depression words come up, to join and spread what you learn, just to help to reduce the stigma that sti still comes with mental health and depression that only improve quality of life for our patients. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I think that you have touched a very interesting and also very important topic. So even before people stopped clapping, I already saw <laughs> a great many of hands. I think this mister on the second row would like to have the word first. Not working. <laughs> if you would like, you can, you can shout. say the question like that and I will repeat it for the audience. So the question was, why do you use mice and not monkeys? Um, depression research is also, stress response is also done in monkey. Um, of course, using an animal comes with ethical implications, right? So monkeys are indeed more similar to humans, but they're also more similar to humans, which means they come with a bigger ethical bargain and with a more complex system that is more difficult to be understood. Mice are simpler, they are still have many things in common with humans, and they're way easier to handle from technical point of view and from ethical point of view. Uh, because, I mean, what you spend for one mouse, for one monkey, you get 100 mice, right? Um, you also need to have different training, it's, it's a completely different thing. Also, monkeys does exist, though, the research. I had to think of the planet of the apes at this question. Mm. So, any further ones? I see one hand over there. Um, thanks for the talk first. And I have one question. Um, does the female mice also has higher rate than male mice to get depression? Yes. Um, so again, we are not talking about depression in mice, but when we talk about being susceptible in to stress, to chronic stress, so changing your behavior after being exposed to chronic stress, Females tend to um, change uh, their behavior more easily. However, and that's actually my PhD topic thesis, uh, female mice are not studied. Um, this is a big bias in neuroscience in general. Neuroscience is based on male mice for many different reasons that we could discuss or not. So females are very much underrepresented so far. 
So that's also why the reason we don't really know why women in general are more prone to develop depression or why they are more susceptible to stress. But the research is now getting back to it. So it's an ongoing so odd topic. Let's get one more question. The guy behind the Christmas tree <laughs> with the beard and glasses <laughs> in the dark. Uh, so thanks for the talk, really nice. Um, I wanted to ask you what you think about the social stigma in humans that um, goes into the numbers of depression between females and males. Sorry, so, uh, can you... So do you think there's a difference because we have a genetic difference or do you think there's a difference between us conception and like gender difference in general? So. Is it because we th see males or males behave different because they think they should behave different, or is it because of the genes? But you mean, what's the connection with the stigma? You mean the difference in the sexes? Sorry, we always talk about sexes biologically, yeah, yeah, not no, gender. Yeah. So the difference in the sexes is measured, yeah. but because you have a perception of the sex. I mean, there's a sex. And the, but how much do you think is this, um, our society doing to this? Oh, because okay. you also conceive yourself as male or female. Yeah, so um, that's maybe a good point. A lot of the way in which depression is diagnosed is somehow by symptoms that are probably less probable to be mm, shown by men because how society works. So men are less prone also to go and get diagnosed that's definitely true. Um, and also, we are now discovering that symptoms are not equal between men and women. Men are, for example, more prone to get anger and aggression, whereas women are more prone to get sad, sadness, for example. So we do have a bias in how we diagnose depression, and, that's my and that comes from society, of course, so how we perceive the two sexes. But we know by biology, basic biology that, for example, the stress system in women and female mice and female rats is more active. So you have the same stress, men and woman, and the woman reacts more. So we know that somehow there is an overreaction in the female, that's maybe you already a lot of other stuff as well, but <laughs> um, we know that's true. We are not 100% sure how big is the sex biases in depression because we might have a diagnosis bias. But that's still in, in ongoing. So thank you for answering those questions. Thank and you. I think I will have a few.